Good evening. On behalf of President Nick Perrin, uh, Dean David Powell and the TEDS faculty, I wanted to officially welcome you to the 2022 DeVar Conference. This is the sixth and uh, final DeVar Conference, which also culminates our six-year project on the doctrine of creation, officially called Evangelical Theology and the Doctrine of Creation, but known to, by most of you, the short name, the Creation Project. Uh, I'd like to introduce this evening's speaker, but before that, I'd like to just give everyone a little more context of the wider um, work of the Creation Project. And before I do that, I'd like to just begin with a, a word of thanks. Big events like this require a lot of planning and attention to details, and so many people are um, worthy of, of recognition and appreciation for the work that they've done. Unfortunately, they weren't able to join this join us this evening, but Mike Murray and John Churchill, formerly of the John Templeton Foundation, uh, are especially worthy of recognition. Uh, before, when, when Tom and I were novice grant writers who knew nothing about outputs and outcomes, uh, they uh, took the time and energy to help us learn the language and uh, write this, this grant, this six-year project, and they remained uh, with us and invested in caring about the project throughout uh, so we are very appreciative of, of their efforts in making this possible. Tom McCall, sitting down, not wearing a suit today, and I'm sure quite enjoying it, uh, was a former director of the Henry Center for almost 10 years and um, visionary for this creation project. Um, Tom, it probably feels strange not standing up here right now. <laughs> I bet you are. But uh, we're so grateful for the, the role that you had at the Henry Center and uh, specifically in this creation project. Uh, big, complicated events like this require lots and lots of detail and attention. That's just for the event like that, throw in a global pandemic, uh, trying to manage a multi-site in Paris, which we'll introduce you to tomorrow, and then a curveball at the last minute, changing the date, moving it forward almost a month, and it's the making of a disaster. Uh, Ian Prince and Heather Cordero, our main program managers for this event, are phenomenal. Don't try and steal them from us. Uh, but uh, they did significant work making all of this happen so smoothly. And uh, so thank you to Ian and Heather. Joel Chop and Matt Wiley, also colleagues at the Henry Center, uh, working fervently on many of the details that round out this event and uh, just bringing the kind of hospitality and um, collegiality that I think makes this event important uh, and special. And last, I want to thank all of you. Uh, we call this a working conference for a reason. Not only do we demand four days of your time, but we ask you to do pre-work in advance and ask you to participate in the whole event. I know you're all very busy and have other things to do. So um, I do know that we're asking a lot for you to be here. And so we're uh, very appreciative of the time that you've given to us. I hope that you'll find it to be uh, a worthy investment of your time over these next four days. Maybe a special thanks as well to the SAS and respondents. The change of date affected them almost as much as us, not only rearranging their schedules, but also having to work on shorter deadlines and make sure that they hit them, which I know is not always easy to do. About the creation project, I began six years ago uh, with what we call a social hypothesis. It was a pretty simple one. The idea is that at least part of the reason that uh, there's uh, tensions between uh, the scientific community and the ecclesial community, science and theology, lies in the fact that we have an anemic or underdeveloped doctrine of creation. And so our sort of contribution to the conversation was a, a rather modest one. We wanted to make uh, progress in, in, uh, in developing the doctrine of creation. Specifically, we set out with four objectives. We wanted to catalyze a field of study in the doctrine of creation. Uh, we wanted to increase understanding in the doctrine of creation, specifically in areas at intersection with uh, the sciences. Uh, third, we wanted to promote intellectual humility. And fourth, uh, we wanted, in areas where there was potential conflict, real or illusory, we wanted to provide uh, clear and public guidance to the church. These are real ecclesial matters. We're an ecclesial community, ecclesial community of many disciplines, and so uh, we set out to do work together. Many projects that, that this creation project uh, consisted in, if you look at your, your booklets, you can see uh, more about the various programs. We've had a resident community here for six years, many of the fellows 
are represented here in the room, and you can see about the works that they've accomplished in a, in a folder. Uh, this event, the Devar Conference, is by far our most intensive and interdisciplinary uh, event. It's, it's an intense four days. Um, but tonight is not intense. Tonight is about feast and fellowship. And uh, so I'm glad to invite our guest speaker tonight, Kevin Van Hooser, who has been asked to cast a vision for us uh, on the topic of our conversations these next three days on personhood. So as Kevin gets ready to come up here, let me introduce him. He is the research professor of systematic theology here at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. He hit the theological scene uh, with his book, Is There a Meaning in the Text? Setting himself as an, a leading voice in evangelical hermeneutics, he has written important monographs on the doctrine of cre uh, the, excuse me the doctrine of uh, on doctrine excuse me on the doctrine of God. When I think of Kevin, there's two things that probably most stick out to me. First, the animating question that he always asks: What does it mean to be biblical? Not just is it biblical, Jack, but what does it mean to be biblical? And second, uh, his articulation of the dramatic nature of theology both the theatrical God and, and our participatory response. So please join me in welcoming uh, this evening's speaker, Dr. Van Hooser. Who or what am I who can say? Theological anthropology, says Mark Cortez, is a Herculean task. Perhaps Hermes, in the person of Paul Ricoeur, can come to Hercules' aid. Ricoeur, a hermeneutic philosopher, once engaged in a notable dialogue with a neuroscientist on the relationship between brains and minds. And he later published as a book entitled What Makes Us Think. Ricoeur tried to mediate their disagreement and prevent a slide into materialism by distinguishing between different kinds of discourse. He said, my initial thesis is that these discourses represent heterogeneous perspectives, which is to say, they cannot be reduced to each other or derived from each other. And for Ricoeur, the issue wasn't substance, but semantic dualism. And this led him to call for a third discourse that could bridge the explanatory power of scientific discourse and the richness of ordinary and religious discourse. But he notably failed to specify what this third way was or how it worked. And there have been many contenders for that role, that role of third mediating discourse, many pretenders to the throne, queen of the sciences. Imagine you're a college student with a passion for personhood. What major do you declare? Psychology, philosophy, sociology, comparative literature? Business, anyone? <laughs> Economists classify rational decision makers as homo economicus. But there are other suggestions as to how to classify the human species in addition to homo sapiens. There's homo ludens, the playing animal. Homo faber, the tool using animal. Homo loquens, the speaking animal. And then my favorites, homo otiosus, slacker man. <laughs> and homo interreticulatus, buried within the rectangle man, which is David Bentley Hart's uh, expression for people when they get lost in their screens. The discursive challenge for us, the first one, is to distinguish person the, from non-persons. And what prompted Ricoeur to search for a third discourse was his desire to avoid reductionism. It's the besetting temptation of academics who are curved in upon their own methodologies and theories. And there are other discursive challenges that lie in wait for us as well. Robert Spayman's Persons examines attempts to articulate the difference between someone and something, the who from the what. Some appeal to what it means to be a rational or intentional being. Others think it's helpful to appeal to relationality or sociality. 
In John Rist's recent book, What is a Person?, he tells a different story. He sees the dichotomy at the center of his book about the mainline tradition, it's essentially the Western and eventually Christian <laughs> position that sees humans as embodied souls. So the mainline, main, mainline tradition on the one hand and the various attempts, uh, modern and postmodern, to dislodge or distort that mainline tradition. And Rist's guiding question in the book, first one is, whether the idea of person adds anything to our understanding of what it is to be human. And his second question is, whether any of the newer approaches available to us today can retrieve and maintain what he calls the mainline tradition. Uh, the term Western theologians eventually applied to answer Augustine's question about the Trinity, three what? Uh, came from an inauspicious source, the theater. The Latin term persona, prosopon in Greek, refers to the mask an actor wore on stage. And originally, persona referred to the role, not the person playing the part, the actor underneath. The Trinitarian heresy of modalism, which views Father, Son, and Spirit as mere roles that God plays, probably reflects this early usage of the term. Later on, Roman jurists used the term persona to refer not only to the role a person plays on stage, but to the role a person plays in society, as well as that person's status in society. But in contrast to our modern usage, the person was not what lay behind the role or under the mask. Under the mask, there was nature, human nature. Uh, Jens Zimmerman observes that up to the arrival of Christianity, the ancient world really had no category for the person as a unique individual whose particular choices could transcend natural inclinations. What can we say about persons unless or until we have faces and not mere masks. Is there someone there? Or is it socially constructed roles all the way down? Eventually, persona came to mean not just the social function, but the person performing it. And yet this in turn gave rise to other disagreements. For example, between those who view personhood as intrinsic and essential to all human beings, and those for whom personhood is a status reserved only for those with the right qualifications, whatever those might be. According to Boethius and his famous definition, what lies beneath the mask is an individual substance of a rational nature. But Peter Singer, a contemporary ethicist, thinks that a pig has a higher degree of self-awareness and a greater capacity for meaning relations with others than a severely retarded or senile human. Singer says, we must grant these animals the right to life as good as or better than such retarded or senile humans. Well, in response to that kind of dehumanizing thought, 20th century personalist thinkers have insisted that personhood is a properly basic category, and they affirm an intrinsic identity between humans and persons. A person is someone, not something, not a mere member of the genus humankind, but a unique and particular and irreplaceable individual. So personalists, this 20th century movement, which spans many disciplines, Personalists resist defining personhood from below, that is, starting with the category animal and then trying to qualify it somehow by specifying the capacities that make this animal a person. And instead, personalists insist that humans have moral worth simply by virtue of being humans. And as to recognizing who qualifies as persons, uh, John Rist, back to him, says this happens not by some social contract, but by their mothers in a personal encounter beginning in her womb. And some personalists go even further, affirming personhood not only as a reality in its own right, 
but as the key to understanding reality itself. To quote Martin Luther King, personalism's insistence that only personality, finite and infinite, is ultimately real, strengthened me in two convictions. It gave me metaphysical and philosophical grounding for the idea of a personal God, and it gave me a metaphysical basis for the dignity and worth of all human personality. And here I'm reminded of von Balthasar's gloss on personalism, which I think is equally as important. Von Balthasar, a Swiss theologian, says, without the biblical background, personalism as a philosophy is inconceivable. So I'm still in my introduction. We've gone from persona to person to personalism. And I hope you can see already how elusive this concept is and contested. Maybe you're wondering, is it worth the bother? I have three more initial questions I want to pose. First, given that personhood is an interdisciplinary topic, which disciplines do you think ought to take priority in the discussion and why? Second, do you agree that the discourse about personhood is often subject to dichotomizing forces? And if so, which tension or tensions should we seek to preserve? And which should we try to resolve? And then a third initial question. Do you resonate with David Kelsey's worry that whatever the term person meant in the context of Trinitarian theology, it can't possibly be generalized to cover human beings, and that the modern concept of person in particular is so culturally dominant yet theologically inadequate as to render it unserviceable. Well, I'm not yet ready to abandon the concept, but Kelsey has a point. We have to attend to the way the word person runs, dare I say, its literal meaning. Because this concept of personhood has gained its significance, not through stipulative definitions, but through the accretion of layers of meaning over centuries. We have to follow the way the word runs. Now, I don't think ordinary language is a philosophical panacea, but I think it's instructive. Even negative examples are illuminating. For example, in the co case of Roe versus Wade, the court concluded that not one of the 16 uses of the term person in the Constitution had any possible prenatal application. Well, I'm intrigued by Wittgenstein's claim, grammar tells what kind of object anything is. Thus, my title tonight, Personhood as Grammar, the Grammatical Subject, and my interest in the ordinary language philosopher P.F. Strawson and his seminal essay, Persons, in which he extrapolates from the uses of the term to try to describe the concept, a concept that he believes is indispensable to human thinking. He says that we refer to persons as individual subjects to whom we ascribe both material and mental predicates. We can say of someone, for example, that that person's tall, and we can say that that person is anxious, a material and a mental property. Strassen goes on to say that persons are basic particulars and personhood is a primitive concept by which he means nothing more basic can be said about persons or personhood. It can't be further analyzed into something more essential. That's a promising start, but at least one critic complains that Strassen has little to say about moral agency, which is a costly omission because there are plenty of non-human animals to which we ascribe both material and mental properties, but not personhood. And moreover, though Strassen illumines the way we use the concept person, he never tells us what a person is, nor have subsequent analytic philosophers, leading Andrew Pinsent to the harsh conclusion that the analytic landscape is no country for real persons. Grammar has apparently failed to live up to its Wittgensteinian promise to show us the promised land of ontology. 
But I'm nevertheless pressing on, undaunted, with my grammatical account of human personhood. The rest of the presentation, then, focuses not on subjects and predicates, however, but on personal pronouns. Latin grammarians distinguished first, second, and third pronouns according to the person who speaks, the person who is spoken to, and the person who is spoken of. These grammar grammarians also referred to the threefold nature of persons. Uh, what they mean is that we can speak of an individual in terms of all three personal pronouns, because pronominal persons are distinguished only by their relative position in a given speech situation. Attending to all three personal pronouns thus serves both as a convenient way of surveying the history of the concept and as a way of bringing certain aspects of personhood to light. At least that's my wager. So we begin by looking at persons in first-person perspective. After all, the paradigmatic linguistic expression of self-consciousness is the first-person pronoun, I. And no ancient thinker excelled in first-person discourse more than Augustine. In his Confessions, he tells his own story. When he gets to Book 10, he begins to explore the remarkable power of human memory that allows him to tell his life as a coherent narrative. Memory, says Augustine, is a palace full of treasure. When I am in this storehouse, I can request whatever I want to be brought forward. Of course, he doesn't say exactly where memory is, but he's awed by the immense depths of his interior world. Charles Taylor, noting Augustine's fascination with the inner depths of his being, suggests that he may be one source of the modern Western self's fascination with inwardness. Taylor says, Augustine is always calling us within. Why within? Because he wants to know God and the soul, and the soul is within, as is the way to God. Taylor says, it's hardly an exaggeration to say that it was Augustine who introduced the inwardness of radical reflexivity and bequeathed it to the Western tradition of thought. Whether or not Augustine invented individualism, he certainly adopted a first-person standpoint. But probably the modern Magna Carta of the first-person perspective is Descartes. I think, therefore I am which is arguably a claim not only about knowledge, but about personhood, inasmuch as it marks this infamous turn to the subject, the knowing subject. That's modernity's upgrade of Boethius's individual substance of a rational nature. And further downstream this tradition, John Locke defines a person as a thinking, intelligent being that consider itself as a self, the same thinking thing, in different times and places. And that last qualification, this ability to re-identify oneself over time, that's crucial for personal identity, uh, not only to answer the question, will I be the same me in heaven, but also for ascertaining, was I responsible for what I said 10 minutes ago? Now, whereas Locke's first-person perspective leans towards the psychological, Kant emphasizes the moral dimension. So I thought we would take a look at Kant's definition of the person from a metaphysics of morals. A person, he says, is a subject whose action can be imputed to him. Moral personality is the freedom of a rational being under moral laws, whereas psychological personality is merely the ability to be conscious of one's identity in different conditions of one's existence. In other words, for Kant, the first-person perspective enables us to see ourselves as the authors of our own actions. This is me acting. And with Kant, we also get a shift to rights talk, which eventually becomes a turn to the legal subject. Black's Law Dictionary defines person as the legal subject or substance of which the right and duties are attributes. Every full citizen is a person. Other human beings, namely subjects who are not citizens, may be persons, 
But not every human being is necessarily a person, for a person is capable of rights and duties, and there may well be human beings having no legal rights, as was the case with slaves in English law. That is from the sixth edition. I think there's at least 11 now. So in the eyes of the law today, corporations are persons. Uh, they can buy land, they can be sued, but they can't vote in presidential elections and they don't spend the night in jail. So what's wrong with this modern picture of persons as knowing moral and legal subjects? Let me suggest three things. First, uh, postmodern thinkers like Michel Foucault have declared the death of the rational knowing subject. The idea that the mind is an insulated central processing unit at the core of our being is simply a fiction, he says. What we take to be self-consciousness is in fact the site where ignorant ideologies clash by night. Our so-called free thinking is in fact a function of our situatedness in time, history, culture, and class. On this view, persons are plastic, susceptible to sociopolitical molding, less cogitos than cogs in the cultural industrial complex that has weaponized social media. Second, and more worrisome, to define persons in terms of rational and moral capacities risks taking as normative a certain class of persons, normally white European males, and then disenfranchising whole swaths of human beings. Neither fetuses nor those with senile dementia satisfy the necessary conditions for thinking intelligent beings that Locke set forth. Well, neither for that matter to some college students. <laughs> the third problem is internal to philosophy itself, back to Strawson. He called it the no ownership or the no subject doctrine of the self. And it's essentially the position that the thinking and experiencing subject is either unreal or inaccessible. Wittgenstein, the same Wittgenstein who encouraged us to follow the way the words run to get clearer about ontology, Wittgenstein examined on a number of occasions the first person pronoun, and he came away skeptical. The word I does not designate a person, he says. Now, the thumb may experience pain when the hammer slips, but the subject of experience itself is beyond our experience. And so Wittgenstein proposes replacing the locution, I have a pain in my thumb, with there is a pain in my thumb, or there's a pain in the thumb, no first perspective, person perspective at all. There's pain, yes, but there's nothing in the experience of pain that corresponds to I. His student, G.E.M. Anscombe, agrees. I is not a referring expression, but she agrees for a different reason. She simply rejects the idea of an immaterial soul. So in light of these critiques, there's reason to think that the first person pronoun may not be as irreducible as its proponents think. And if the eyes don't have it, it being metaphysical substance and significance, then neither can the cogito. The first person grammatical subject may be a dead end. So we turn to other attempts to articulate personhood in the third person. Uh, Kant thought the physical sciences could speak with authority about nature, but not about freedom or moral agency. And that raises the question, can any amount of knowledge about the laws of nature do justice to human nature? If the third person discourse of neuroscience could explain consciousness, would it explain the first person perspective or would it explain it away? Speaking purely neurobiologically, the difference between humans and higher primates is a matter of degree only, not kind. Some scientists claim to have discovered in certain animal species skills previously thought to be exclusive to humans. Tool making, language, one person even suggests politics. 
The increasing awareness of our evolutionary kinship to animals, combined with a decreasing belief in Christian doctrines, like the image of God, has led to what one person calls a de-reification of animals. We no longer think of animals as things. The French Civil Code was amended in 2015 to define animals as sentient living beings, des êtres vivants dués de sensibilité. Certain animal activists, including members of the Helsinki Group for Cetacean Rights, want to accord to some animal species the status of non-human person. If it is indeed true that little remains of cognitive, emotional, volitional, or social activity for which neuroscientists have not at least begun to develop biological th theories, then the challenge is going to be to resist the temptation to reduce everything we want to say about the human person to this or that third person scientific discourse, like sociobiology and then to avoid associating personhood with any one set of brain functions. That's the temptation, to avoid those things. I don't think metaphysics or morals are the province of the physical sciences, including brain science. From the perspective of personalist metaphysics, a human doesn't have to check off certain cognitive boxes in order to be counted a person. Unborn fetuses are not potential persons, they're rather persons with potential, but that's a metaphysical claim. Let's turn to the human sciences, like psychology, sociology, history, and economics. These are forms of third uh, person discourse as well, but their focus is not on the brain per se, it's on understanding human behavior. Uh, Wilhelm Diltai held that what humans do, other than by reflex, cannot be given causal explanations. Our reflexes can, yes, but nothing else we do. Everything else we do, other than by reflex, is an expression of our spirit, Geist. So we call them the Geisteswissenschaften. But it can be studied and interpreted, what we do. We can get at Geist by looking at what people do, just as we do other texts. We can do the hermeneutics in the human sciences, and people have tried that. But at present, there's a tendency to highlight one's scientific credentials, even in the human sciences, and you do this by adopting methodologies similar to those used in the natural sciences. So a number of human scientists happily employ statistics and clinical observations and lab work too. Um, I've been interested to see the field of digital humanities grow that applies computer-based technologies to the study of literature. <coughs> Christian Smith, a sociologist, reacts against this methodological mania and sets forth in his ambitious book, What is a Person? A Via Media. I think he's striving for what Ricoeur called this third discourse. Something between positive, positivist empiricism, which reduces reality to what we can observe, or social constructivism, which cuts loose from uh, the metaphysical moorings. Smith is a personalist. Uh, the proof? His 66-word definition of a person, in which every phrase is there for a reason, just as it is in the Nicene Creed. And here's an abridged 34-word version. He says, a person is a conscious, reflexive, embodied, self-transcending center of subjective experience, durable identity, moral commitment, and social communication, who exercises complex capacities for agency and intersubjectivity in order to develop loving relationships with other personal selves. Where previous definitions highlighted rationality, Smith lists 30 capacities unique to human being, including truth-seeking and interpersonal communion. He also insists personhood subsists as real ontological being, not reducible to the lower-level entities that emergently compose it. 
He sees the person as a center of consciousness and activity. And how the person emerges from the swamp of little gray cells is, he says, the holy grail of neuroscience. But perhaps no other form of third-person discourse is better at understanding persons as centers of consciousness and activity than narrative, stories, and histories. You see, opening a person's skull takes us only so far in understanding them. A less direct, yet arguably better way is to listen to what they say, to watch what they do, because everything we say and do expresses our desire to be and our effort to exist, or what scripture might call our heart. There's a narrative quality to lived human experience. This was certainly Recur's holy grail in his philosophical anthropology. He's an exegete of human being. His watchword is existence via semantics. That is, instead of the Cartesian approach where you think about yourself, Recur says we attain human subjectivity indirectly, sideways, by interpreting the signs and acts that disclose our capacities, our ability to choose and act and love. And this is not the kind of study you conduct in a science lab, but Recur views fiction itself as a kind of laboratory in which we can examine various ways of human being in time. Thomas Hardy, in his preface to the Wessex edition of his novels, uh, explains why all of his novels are set in the same imaginary location. He says, I consider that the domestic emotions have throbbed in Wessex nooks with as much intensity as in the palaces of Europe, and that anyhow, there was quite enough human nature in Wessex for one man's literary purpose. Recur says that what we discover in stories and histories is not Sartre's useless passion, but rather the joy of yes in the sadness of the finite. For Recur, a person is a subject to whom actions can be ascribed, responsibility imputed, and about whom stories may be told. But we turn now to consider second person discourse. And my thesis is that second person discourse is essential, not only for understanding other persons, but for understanding personhood itself. To anticipate, I think a person is one who's able to enter into second-person relations with other persons. The three persons are what they are only in relation to the other two. That's certainly the case in the Trinity. But humans created in God's image are persons in relation as well. Now, it's one thing to know information about a person, to have third-person knowledge, quite another to have a second-person experience where you interact consciously and directly with another person who is conscious and present to you as a person. An experience that Eleanor Stump describes as an instance of Franciscan knowledge. The second person perspective provides a unique epistemic access to our knowledge of other persons then. It yields something different from first person subjectivity or third person objectivity. The personalist philosopher John McMurray sees the second person relation of mother and child as the basic form of human existence. Personal existence, he says, is not the individual, but two persons in personal relation. So the second person perspective is intersubjective, and as such, it provides a unique kind of access to certain facts about other people's mental states. It involves inputting to others, sorry, it involves imputing to others certain mental states with which one is personally familiar while simultaneously acknowledging a distinction between oneself and another. So this means we can weep with those who weep, not because we're experiencing exactly what they are, but we can identify imaginatively with their experience based on our own. But a second person perspective requires an even higher level of self-awareness than the first person, 
inasmuch as it implies adopting somebody else's perspective. That requires more than self-consciousness. And let me now go on to suggest that it's only in theology where second-person discourse truly comes into its own. Well, not all theology, because every reference to God in Aristotle is in the third person. But contrast that with Augustine, whose confessions are also an example of second-person discourse because they're written as an address to God in prayer. He says, you called and cried to me and broke open my deafness, and you sent forth your beams and shone upon me and chased away my blindness. I tasted you and now hunger and thirst for you. Indeed, Augustine's genuine first-person knowledge is a function of his second-person hearing of God's address. For Augustine to be an I to himself already presupposes that God is a you to him and that Augustine is a you to God. In the beginning is the I-thou relation. The divine address is primordial. The basis of human dignity has everything to do with being addressed by God. John Crosby puts it like this. He says, it is the experience of the living God calling me by name, calling me to account for my life at the end of it, letting me to stand before him face to face. This cannot fail to awaken and deepen and confirm in me the conviction that I am not just a specimen of rational nature, that I am not replaceable by subsequent persons, that I have an incomparable worth as this person. Andrew Pinsent has argued that Thomas Aquinas makes the second-person perspective, an orientation towards friendship, the underlying principle in his account of virtue formation. Friendship is when one shares awareness of shared focus with a second person, and one aligns one's stances with that person. Well, this puts me in mind of Abraham, friend of God, says James 2.23, or of the way Job, through dialogue with God, begins to understand his suffering from another perspective, not because he got a theodicy, but because he's experienced the greatness of God. I like uh, Samuel Ballantyne's pithy gloss. He says, Job had demanded justice. What he was granted was communion. Personal identity, far from being self-constituting then, is rather a function of being known by God as a second-person phenomenon. Um, one of the best books I've found on this in biblical studies is Susan Eastman's book, Paul and the Person. It's an interdisciplinary study in which she argues that human persons are formed in dialogical encounters with others, encounters that require our being embedded and embodied on earth. She points out that grammatically speaking, Paul's letters are second person communications to particular communities. I enjoy her book. Uh, however, she didn't relate her second person Pauline anthropology to the Lord's Supper. And I think she could have. Think about it. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul roundly criticizes the Corinthians for their first-person perspective. He says, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat, for in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. And then he reminds them of Jesus' words. This is my body, which is for you. Second person, plural. And this gets us close to the sweet spot of Eastman's theological anthropology. Human beings have dignity because the eternal Son of God assumed our bodily estate, taking on the form of a servant. She says, if there were a working denotation of person, it would be one for whom Christ died. Jesus says not only, this is my body, that's a third person statement, but he adds, which is given for you. Second person address. So everything about the Lord's Supper is thoroughly interpersonal. 
Paul enjoins his readers to discern the body, 1 Corinthians 11, 29. And even if he isn't referring to the church, he's at least calling for their joint attention to focus on Jesus' body. Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body. Talk about being in communion. And let's not forget the other term, Eucharist, from the Greek eucharisto, meaning I give thanks. That sounds like first-person discourse, but if you think about it, thanking is necessarily other-directed. Paul exhorts us to address one another in spiritual songs and to give thanks always and for everything to God the Father, Ephesians 5.19. The watchword for the Christian, and the last word for my section on second-person discourse, must be Eucharisto ergo sum. I thank, therefore I am. These two second-person activities, prayer and the Lord's Supper, show us what it means to be human persons, embodied communicative agents oriented to spiritual communion. I conclude with a brief summary, a last batch of questions and a final image to ponder. Uh, we began with Ricoeur's dialogue with a neuroscientist and his call for a third discourse that could mediate between his hermeneutics of the I am and the neuroscientist's explanatory it is. I introduced the second person perspective and said that the intersubjectivity it articulates is both irreducible and indispensable. Hence, my thesis, this is my thesis. <laughs> A full articulation of personhood requires all three personal pronouns. Nevertheless, the second person perspective on its own is not Ricoeur's third discourse either. In order to speak rightly of human personhood and to do justice to the three phenomenal perspectives and to all the various academic disciplines that want in on the action, we need not one master one discourse and we don't need one master discourse, we actually need many ministerial discourses. It's because the human person is a physical, biological, psychological, and spiritual reality, because these are all aspects of a person's reality, they're inter interdependent, it's because they're all real that we need a multi-layered discourse. And my plea would be that theological discourse should be part of the mix if we want to do justice to the complexity of the human heart and to things like David's confessions, against you only have I sinned. We can't do justice to that aspect of the human heart without bringing theological discourse into the discussion. I've already mentioned Christian Smith's definition and his 30 layers of human capacities let me now commend Mary Vandenberg's own multi-layered definition uh, taken from a forthcoming book, I hope that's legal, uh, Aquinas, Science, and Human Uniqueness, an Integrated Approach to the Question of What Makes Us Human. Mary was a fellow here, I don't know if that, was that her project? Good. She says, humans are complex, material, spiritual, intellective, worshiping beings specially created this way by God with the ultimate purpose of knowing and loving God. So her discourse is multi-layered. She acknowledges the rational, relational, and functional models of what it is to be in the image of God. But she does go on to claim with Aquinas the primacy of the intellective aspects because, she says, it's deeply tied to our ability to function in relationship with God. She also suggests that the soul of a profoundly disabled person may be able to actualize its intellective capacity with God's assistance, just as a separated soul maintains its intellective capacity post-mortem with God's assistance. This leads me to a last batch of questions, three questions. First, is any approach, whether of the arts or the sciences, able to avoid reductionism in order to do justice to the first, second, and third person perspectives alike? 
What bearing, if any, does a grammatical account of personhood, with its insistence on all three personal pronouns, have on the question of substance dualism or on the question of human uniqueness? And then thirdly, what exactly is the relationship between human personhood and the image of God? I don't think we can simply equate personhood with the image because angels are persons, but not, his, not God's images. And that prompts the follow-up question, where in my account is Jesus Christ, whom Paul identified as the image of God? Uh, spoiler alert, his coming is imminent. So the human person is a grammatical subject with communicative capacities oriented to communion. The second person perspective is essential because we're not self-constituting. We're called into existence by another. We know ourselves properly only in relation to the divine thou who invokes us into being. And I think the etymology of person is interesting. Per sonare, to sound through. Might it be that we're not merely images but echoes of God? And that leads me to suggest a last classification for the human species, homo respondens. Whoops. We speak because he first spoke us and to us. Human persons are not autonomous individuals. We're answerable animals, answerable to the one who created us in his image. C.S. Lewis asks, does it not make a great difference whether I am, so to speak, the landlord of my own mind and body, or only a tenant responsible to the real landlord. David Kelsey says something similar in his book. He says, human creatures are constituted as personal beings by God relating to them, not by certain types of creaturely capacities. So what makes men and women like God has to do with their being spoken to and their ability to speak back. Individuality is more a matter of answerability, here I am, than of assertability, I think, therefore I am. Humans are grammatical subjects, but at this concluding moment, I want to put the spotlight now on the vocative case, also known as the nominative of address. Persons are vocative subjects, subjects with vocations, who exist in a call and response relation to God and human others. The human watchword is not, I think, therefore I am, but Abraham, Jacob's, Moses, Samuel's, Isaiah's, Ananias's, and others, here I am. Isaiah actually says more, here I am, send me. And that's apt, because being a human person in the image of God involves mission as well as vocation. It's not enough to know the species of which one is a, num uh, which of which one is a member. That only gets us so far as knowing what one is. We need to know who we are and what we're here for, and that comes only through divine address. According to Hans Urs von Balthasar, being a who a person, and having a divinely authorized mission amount to the same thing. Every man and woman has a divinely authored mission, but in Balthazar's opinion, it's only Christ in whom person and mission are identical. But perhaps we could say that personhood, whether divine or human, is missionary. This comes close to Richard Middleton's idea that the Imago Dei designates the royal office or calling of human beings as God's representatives and agents in the world. This is the role in which humans have been cast in the great divine human drama, which, like all drama, is all about second person interaction. To be a human person, then, is not to assume some arbitrary or self-chosen persona. It's rather to accept the role God has assigned to us, that is, to be representatives of his rule 
in a particular way in one's own place and time with others. Balthazar again, when a human being becomes a person theologically by being given a unique vocation and mission, he simultaneously deprivatized, socialized, made into a locus and a bearer of community. Jesus is the paradigmatic human being. And Jesus' enactments of appropriate responses to God's call on his life provide case studies in how we should live as images of God. Human persons, then, are biosocial, spiritual sounding boards, answerable and accountable to God, grammatical subjects whose mission is to glorify the thou who called them into existence. So in the spirit of this second person personhood, I thank God and I thank you. Thanks. You say, uh, you're asking whether the metaphysics belongs with the relationships. Um, great question. Uh, this has to do also with my earlier question, what dichotomies do we think we need to discuss? And one, I think, is you know, individual versus relationship. There have been lots of people who've proposed relational ontologies of the human person. Um, I don't want to say it's relationships all the way down, because then I think we lose the individual. So even in the doctrine of the Trinity, yes, the Trinity is eternal relationships, but Father, Son, and Spirit remain particular persons. Um, it's, it's, it's tricky. Theologians have known it's been tricky for centuries because if you define the difference between the persons in terms of relationships, which is what the Western tradition has done, you then have to specify how each one differs from the other. And the way the tradition has done it is simply by specifying relationships of origin. So this language of begottenness and begetting, that's the way we do it. But I think I'm trying to affirm your point. We don't want to lose relationships. I don't know that I want to meta make it all. I don't want to reduce all the metaphysics of personhood to simply two relations. Uh, this is a, a topic for all of us, I think, over the next few days. I'll ask a question now. Okay. Thanks, Kevin, so much. Um, th this is relevant to your, your answer to Josh actually uh, encouraged me to get up off my seat and uh, ask this question, so it's, it's piggybacking. Um, I w it seemed to me you were pretty quick to, to jump on the Wittgensteinian bandwagon. Uh, surprised how quick you, you, you were, how much credit you gave to the sort of skepticism about the subject in a 20th century philosophy. So um, Roderick Chisholm responds to this skepticism and says, well, hang on. We identify objects by their properties. I identify myself introspectively by my properties, right? I feel pain. Ah, there's me. That's, I've, I've directly identified me. <laughs> there's no more looking that needs to happen. Um, it, it seems to me also that in the second person address, I, I, I'm encountering a subject. 
um, maybe I don't have to be able to be self-aware in order to, you know, aware of myself as a subject in order to see you as a subject. But somehow I see you as a unit, as a unit, right? As a as a one one person. So anyway, I was just wondering if you wanted to say more about uh, why we should give any credit to this rather than just thinking of this as so much kind of positivist empiricism. You know, oh, there's no there's no individual subject. So I don't know that I jumped on a bandwagon. <laughs> I, I, I mentioned him, I used him, because I was looking for a critic of someone who wanted to simply stick with a first person perspective. And their name is Legion these days. That doesn't mean they're right. I think what I was calling for at the end of the day is the use of all three persons. So I don't want to lose what I think you care about as well, which is someone someone inhabits a name and a nature, right? There's an entity, a subject there. So I'm, I was reporting okay. on the death of the subject. Perhaps that death was slightly exaggerated. Good, thanks. <laughs>Thanks, Kevin. Kind of Eucharistic question. Um, and you asked the question about substance dualism, too. So um, in your categorization of the utterance, this is my body as a third person sentence, does that require substance dualism? Well, um, you are the expert on this question. On the Eucharist, not human ontology. I think it requires a distinction between body and something else. Whether, I mean, you know how the various ways to parse it, does it have to be substance dualism? What kind of substance is it? Um, I don't have a strong feeling about that. I think it's a great question. I don't know that I have a strong position I want to defend on this. I'm inclined to say yes, but um, if you ask me why, I won't have many good reasons. I'll take that. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. You gave us quite a tour through uh, Western uh, thinking on this topic, and I couldn't get past a very early quote you gave from uh, Jens Zimmerman that this idea of person wasn't around until Christianity and wondered what that means exactly. Did uh, Christianity discover this concept? Was it revealed somehow? And certainly then the uh, elaboration and understanding of it, if it's, if it's not a social construct, is highly influenced by mm -hmm. cultures, mm -hmm. uh, which made me wonder whether uh, breaking outside of the Western tradition might give some additional insights, and I don't expect you to be, a, be an expert in all areas here, but wondered if you'd considered that at all, looked at anything beyond the Western tradition, and whether there may be any insights that would help us in that regard. I did, uh, because that's a fair question. The people who I was reading were Westerners telling the story of the concept of person, and they told it in a pretty Western way, and so I had exactly your thought. Are you telling me that, you know, unless you descended from the Stoics, you know, you don't have a name or a history, or you can't tell stories about yourself? I actually started reading fiction from other cultures just to get a better sense of what it felt like not to be a Westerner as a person. Um, the one, so one book I came up, discovered was I Am a Cat, <laughs> a Japanese novel on, told from the cat's perspective. Uh, because I was looking for something was first person from an Asian perspective. And um, I only found legends and, you know, that were third person accounts. So, and I have not done an exhaustive search. Christina will tell me about things that I've missed. But I was struck that one of the books I came across, the cat was the narrator. But it, but the, it was speaking in the first person the whole time. So clearly there was a first person perspective. Look, I, I looked enough to know that I was out of my depth. There, there is an interesting literature out there. The person, it's an anthropologist who's done some work on this. There was one, uh, uh, Gauss, it's Gauss, the chap who wrote on the gift in, in Indonesian or Javanese culture. Uh, Maus, M-A-U-S-S, -S, he's done this. And again, I just read enough to realize that it was out of my depth, or at least I didn't have the time to do it justice. So there are some interesting things about personhood in non-Western perspective, 
that if I were being truly encyclopedic, I should have done, but I also knew I had a time limit, which I think I've trespassed. Tom. If we've trespassed, that's okay. I won't trespass. No, later. please. Yeah. Uh, it's good to see you. Thank you. Always interesting and always uh, always provocative. Thank you so much. I just question just to help me get a little bit more clear about where you're moving from the descriptive elements to your own proposal. And so I'm thinking of the right at the very end the the quote that you read and showed from um, from Balthazar, um, which I think began with when um, one becomes a person. And so I'm, I'm still wondering to what extent is personhood something that must be gotten? And in, or is, is it, in what sense is it something that one just is or mm -hmm. has? Because it wasn't clear to me which of those um, fits with various of the statements. Yeah. So what, maybe one way of sharpening this is just this. The first, second, and third person perspectives, are those all individually necessary, jointly sufficient conditions for being a person? Do we need all three? Do any two of the three you know, suffice? And then secondly, must those be gained, right? Um, you have to develop those or receive those, uh, those abilities. So uh, that would be helpful for me, thank you. Yeah, my own view, of course, is that we are persons. We don't have to attain the status. My claim was we need all three person perspectives fully to articulate what it means to be a person. But then I did, I did quote Balthazar. Not every quote was one that had my imprimatur, but I just thought it was an interesting quote. Um, and I was paid to give coverage, not to articulate my own thesis, so that was... <laughs> That was a bonus. <laughs> and so, but it's also underdeveloped, it's underdeveloped. Um, so I don't want to say, the only thing that, wa that makes us a person is God's call. And God's call in the first instance is, is the call that evokes us into being. So in other words, because God calls us out of nothingness into being, that's what makes us a person. He make, God's creating us, calling us into existence. So maybe we're into theological discussions going further than we can tonight, but in that case, is the call always effectual? Well, you know what I think about the effectual call, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, there are people who have thought that only those who are sort of elect really get to count fully as persons. Oh, no, no, I, I'm, I'm I, talking I'm about... I'm not suggesting you mean that, but I'm just asking if the call is what makes us a person. Yeah. Well on some theological accounts, only some people get the real call. So are they the only ones who are so persons? Are, I or think so. are I we think, talking about calls in different senses I here? think we're equivocating on the term okay. call. When I was thinking about vocation, I'm thinking about a primordial call the, sure. that evokes us into existence. The call of grace is something different. I haven't touched that tonight. <laughs> okay. uh, maybe I've confused you, though, by throwing... Balthazar's quote in that talked about becoming a person. That's no part of my argument, right? I, I was basically saying we're persons with potential, we're not potential persons. Thanks for the sharpening, though. Great, thank you, Kevin. Thank you all, and we look forward to uh, a lot more of the same over the next three days together. Uh, just uh, two simple announcements. Uh, this is where we are throughout the weekend. Uh, so tomorrow morning, uh, in this building that is, tomorrow morning breakfast is at 7.30, and the first session is at 8.30. So breakfast is at 7.30 at the far end of the building in Lantern Lounge. Uh, the first session will begin in this room at 8.30. Sessions run 90 minutes, uh, and we'll have uh, discussion interwoven in there. 
Uh, I will uh, recognize that there are uh, a few scheduling typos in your programs. So the best place to find the accurate schedule is right around your neck. Uh, just flip this over and our session times are correct on here. Uh, so 7.30 breakfast, 8.30 session. Uh, the, the timing uh, as such is to accommodate our satellite group, uh, a group of scientists and theologians from the uh, Biblical Institute of Nogent outside, Nogent France, outside Paris. They'll be joining us via live satellite uh, and a seven hour time difference. So uh, working cooperati cooperatively with them and we'll get to see and hear from them tomorrow. So with that, you're dismissed. Have a pleasant evening. Uh, let myself or our staff know if you have any questions or need anything. Good night. <laughs>